I want to talk about God pushing us to the edge. And it's a bit uncomfortable, it's a bit strange, it's a bit weird, but it's the things that God does. And I found myself in a number of situations where I felt, oh, I'm gonna have to take a step of faith here. The most difficult and awkward and challenging people to pray for are other Christians. One of the wonderful things about this church, having been here for 373 years or whatever it is, I think that's right, and the fact that many of us have been in this church a long time and that we're very involved and connected with the communities all over the place, is that when you bump into someone, invariably they know someone else in the church. It happens to me all the time. I bump into someone and I'll say, I'll tell them that I'm involved here. Oh, I know someone from your church and they'll tell me about them. Normally, they're quite nice about them. There are some exceptions, but I'll chat to you afterwards about who you are. A couple of weeks ago, I was inevitably playing golf and at Siren Sester and was being let through by players in front of me, don't worry about the details, and was chatting to the people who were letting me through. And it was a father and his younger son. And we had to wait for a moment. And so I was talking to them and said, where are you from? Where do you live? That sort of thing and they lived in South Cerny, some of you live in South Cerny, and I said to the, the son, I said, oh, do you go to school there? And he said, yes. I said, that's Anne Edwards' school, isn't it? And he said, how do you know the name of my school? And I said, well, I've, I've got a friend who I work with who goes in there and does assemblies, does morning worship in the school. I said, do you know her? And he thought for a moment and he said, is that the crazy lady? And um, I said, yep, that's her, Lizzie, she, we call her. And it's great, do listen to what she says. He did say they were really good, what she did, but I thought that straight away, the crazy lady. We're continuing our series called Step Out in Faith. And we've been doing this for a number of weeks, looking at stories in the Bible where God's called people to take particular risks, to step of faith, trusting that God will work. And I don't know about you, but certainly for me, and obviously I've been doing some of the talking about it, it's challenged me. And I found myself in a number of situations where I felt, oh, I'm going to have to take a step of faith here. And I prefer to avoid it, but I'm, I need to because it's what God's talking to me about. I was at the university a couple of weeks back, the Royal Agriculture University, and I was there and a chap who's a member of staff, I know fairly well, was just walking past me and I said, hello, and he said, hi. And he was doing that thing that people do. He was holding his mouth, his tongue in it like that. What was his problem? Toothache, that's what you do when you've got a problem with your tooth. So he said that. And I had two seconds to make a decision at that moment. Do I ignore that or do I do something about it? And we've been talking about that in our series about taking steps of faith. So I said, what's the matter? I mean, stupid question, but you know, you have to start something. What's the matter with you? He said, oh, and then he gave me lots of dental detail that I didn't need about his problem. And what's the matter? And he told me, and so I then said, I'm going to pray that that gets better. And he said, oh, all right then. And he was gone. So I thought, right, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray and ask that God would heal, take the pain away in his mouth, whatever it is. The following week, I was back in the same place in the cafe there, and he was in there moving some tables around, and I shouted, and now this was, oh, I've, I've now got to ask what's happened. So I shouted across at him, what, how's your teeth? And he said, oh, yeah, it, it, it cleared up. And that was it, and then he was gone. And I, I realized, I, I, oh, I should have pounced at that point. Well, look. So what's happened? What I've noticed is how many of those opportunities are all around me. But because we've been talking about it, they're in my head and I've taken some steps that I probably would otherwise have let pass by. So I encourage us to do the same. This morning, not the edge of sanity or anything like that, but pushing us to the edge. Push to the edge. We're going to read something from the Bible. So if you've got a Bible, you may want to turn to it. We're in the book of Acts 
in the New Testament, Acts chapter 10. We're going to read a slightly longer story about Peter. So Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, one of the apostles, and his encounter with a man called Cornelius. And the well, part of the story is that Cornelius is not Jewish. He's a Roman soldier. In fact, a Roman officer, a centurion. And this is a very significant moment in the history of God's dealings with humanity. And it's why this story is included in the book of Acts. So we're going to read Acts chapter 10. We're going to jump in at verse 9. There's stuff before it that's relevant and stuff after it. We're going to read verses 9 to 29 to grab some of this story, but do read the rest of it to get the context. Peter went up onto the flat roof, the uh, roof of a house he was in, on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon and he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance and he saw the sky open and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all kinds of animals, reptiles and birds, and then a voice said to him, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared. I've never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times and then the sheep was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Peter was very perplexed. What could the vision mean? And just then the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house. Standing outside the gate, they asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs and go to them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. So Peter went down and said, I'm the man you're looking for. Why have you come? And they said, we were sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He is a devout and God-fearing man, well respected by all the Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so that he can hear your message. So Peter invited the men to stay for the night. The next day he went with them, accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. Last bit. They arrived in Caesarea the following day. Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. Peter pulled him up and said, stand up. I'm a human being just like you. And so they talked together and went inside where many others were assembled. Peter told them, you know, it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. Amen. Amen. Lord, I pray as we look at this story, would you speak to us? Would you stir us? Those that have said yes to following you, I pray that you would stir us. In Jesus' name, amen. I begin this morning with some bad news, friends. Some bad news. The bad news is this, that if you're a Christian who prays for other people and prays and asks God to intervene in your life, the bad news is this, that the hardest people to pray for are Christians. The most difficult and awkward and challenging people to pray for are other Christians. It's not the praying that's the problem. The praying bit's easy. It's seeing the answers to those prayers. What do I mean by that? Well, I've mentioned here before that I, over the years as being a Christian, was part of a team that used to go to very large New Age festivals that took place still do, in central London a couple of times a year. There'd be all these stalls there with different people offering all sorts of different spiritualities, Buddhist spirituality, Hindu spirituality, witchcraft, Reiki healing, all sorts of stuff there. Place smelt of incense, lots of people wore purple, there was chanting, all sorts of things. They love purple. No offense if you're wearing purple, it's a nice color. All the colours are nice. So I'm going off on one now. There was a lot of purple. Anyway. 
And you could go to all these various stands and many of them were offering spiritual things for healing or to sort your life out. And we as Christians, we had our own stand. It was called the Jesus Experience. And we were talking about God. We were sharing stuff in the Bible, chatting about the gospel. But one of the things we were also doing was offering to pray for people, pray for people for anything, particularly prayer for healing, but lots of other things as well. And unlike when I pray for people in church, when we prayed for people there, every single person I prayed for, I remember, was saying that they were healed. All of those that could tell straight away. Some people, you know, had to go and check with their doctor or whatever, but everybody we prayed for seemed to be healed by Jesus. And the big advantage was that we were free. All the other stands were charging £40 a go, and we were free. So they said, oh, go to the, the Jesus weirdos. They'll pray. They're free. And they'd come to us, and then they'd get healed. It was fantastic. So if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, fantastic, your luck's in, and we're going to pray all sorts of things will happen. If you are a Christian, it's a bit more difficult. Why? Why am I saying this? It might sound like nonsense. What's he talking about? It's because people who do not yet know Jesus, people who have not yet encountered God, not yet come into God's kingdom, are part of what one preacher called the club of the 100th sheep. The club of the 100th sheep. Some of you will be familiar with Jesus' parable where he describes himself as a shepherd and the fact that he asks the question, if you've got 100 sheep and one of them's lost, what do you do? And the answer is you leave the 99 that you've already got and you go and find the lost one. And that's what Jesus does. And for those of us who are already in, that's fantastic, we're in. God's found us, it's wonderful. Doesn't mean everything's easy and sorted, but we're in and we have an eternity promised with God, amen? And that's good. And what Jesus says is great, you lot are in, I'm off. I'm off to find some more of these lost ones, the club of the 100th sheep. The shepherd leaves the 99 and heads out to the lost sheep. And as a result of that, it's there, it's here that the action is. It's with those 100th sheep people. That's where the action is. That's often where the most exciting things, where God's greatest miracles happen, is out there. Can any of you remember, if you were here last week, what the passage was that we were talking about last week? It's really hard, isn't it, when someone asks that question. The Canaanite woman. And Jesus heals, well, delivers this woman's daughter. And she's a foreigner. Not just a foreigner, but a cursed foreigner. She's not Jewish. And she has to go through this haggling thing with Jesus. And a miracle comes. This is where the action is. The fire, God's fire is at the edge, is at the edge. God loves the edge where we as God's people, where his kingdom comes into contact with those who don't yet know Jesus. And I would say to any of us who are Christians here today, that if we want to see some of those wonderful things that God does, some of those miracles, some of those things that require a step of faith, then we need to push to the edge. We need to push to the edge. It's not that God isn't interested in those of us that have already said yes to him. Of course he is. He says he'll be with us and with us for eternity. It's just that it seems to be, and hundreds and hundreds of other Christians would testify this, that the real action happens out there on the edge with those that haven't yet met him. And let's think about our story today. We've reached this point in the story of God's dealings with human beings. We come into this chapter in Acts chapter 10 
and the dam is creaking. The pressure of the water has been building up against the dam and this is the moment that the dam breaks. There's hints of it as you read through the Bible. And then when Jesus comes, he does it again and again and again. And what he is saying is that his message, God's plan for the world, is not just for the Jewish people, but actually it's for everybody who's willing to come to God by faith. And there's been hints of that, bits and pieces of that. And now we get to the point where the dam is ready to break and here in Acts chapter 10, it smashes through. Jesus has been hinting at it throughout his ministry. Some of you will remember the story where Jesus stands up at the beginning of his ministry. It's recorded in Luke's gospel. He stands up in the synagogue and he reads out a passage from the Bible. Anyone remember what that passage was? Spirit of the Lord is on me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, freedom the oppressed, and the day of the Lord's favour. He's quoting from the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. And then he stands up, he reads this out and says, Today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. It's like a mic drop moment and he sits down and everyone starts asking him questions. And so he tells some stories and he tells stories designed to wind up his audience a bit. And he goes back to the Old Testament. He says there were many lepers in Israel. But which one did God heal? Naaman, the foreigner. Not just a foreigner, but a foreign general who was beating you up. God went to him, the guy outside. And then he says there were loads of widows in Israel, but which one did God come to? The widow of Zarephath. We did the story a few weeks ago. He steps out again and again. So Jesus keeps hinting at that. He keeps healing the wrong people and on the wrong day. He always does do it on a Saturday. Little hints, little hints, little hints. And finally here, the breakthrough comes. God is welcoming everyone who comes by faith to him. That's 98.2% of the world, sorry, 98.8% of the world's population. Only 0.2% of the world's population are Jewish. But the other 98.8%, which includes most of us here, we're in two if we come by faith. Amen. And this is the moment where it breaks open. Let's have a quick look. Peter goes up on the roof to pray. It was noon. The typical Jewish practice of prayer was to pray in the morning, to pray at lunchtime, and then to pray in the evening three times a day. Can I say, just as an aside, for those of us who are Christians, which is most of us here or at home, can I encourage you to find a way to pray every day, some way. Whatever it looks like in the midst of your life and all the stuff that's going on for you or me, can you find a place, a way to pray every day? Jesus says, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father in secret, and the Father who sees in secret will reward you. Can I encourage you to do that? You can do it in your room, you can do it in your car on the way to work, you can do it walking the dog, you can go up on the roof if you want, although flat roofs, pitch roofs, not so good, but please, I encourage you. It's so valuable as part of our walk with God. So he does this. And he has a vision. I don't know if he got a vision every time he prayed, probably not. But on this occasion, he has a vision. It says he fell into a trance. It was quite a powerful vision. And he sees this vision of a sheet coming down from heaven, full of animals. And it's all the wrong animals. It's not the sheep. Then we've got a sheep over there. We've got two of them with loads of sheep on. Look at them up there. But not them. We like sheep. It's all the bad animals. It's all this lot. All the ones that Jewish people are not meant to eat. Pigs, there's definitely going to be pigs in there. It's all shellfish. There'll be lobsters and prawns and all sorts. What else? Ducks. We like ducks, don't we? Very good. Squid. I don't like squid. And uh, 
Sh I never had shark. I don't know about that. Anyway, all of those in there, in this sheet, really bizarre sheet full of things that they're not meant to be eating. Pigs, lobsters, crows. We're not meant to eat crows. Crocodiles, no reptiles. We're not into those. I've often said, this is an aside, but one of the big selling points of Christianity compared to all the other major world religions is that we're the only religion in the world that's allowed to eat bacon sandwiches. And that, that's, that should be a key selling point for us. You don't have to, by the way. It's not compulsory. Oh, no, I'm sorry, you've got to make... <laughs> it's just you are allowed to. He has this vision and sees this sheet coming down from heaven with all these unclean animals on. And God says, kill and eat. Peter says, no, we're talking about, I don't eat this stuff. I don't do pigs. I don't do lobsters. I'm a proper believing man. I don't do that. But the voice spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The vision's repeated three times and then the sheet went away. Peter's puzzled, really puzzled. What could this vision mean? What could it mean? Now Cornelius has also had a vision. God's also spoken to him and he's told, send some people to this house. So the people are on the way. And then Peter's puzzled by this vision and then God speaks to him again. The Holy Spirit comes and says to him again, Three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs and go to them without hesitation. Don't worry for I have sent them. God speaks. God's making the connection between Cornelius and Peter. And now they meet. And Peter says, okay, I'm going to come to your house. And he arrives the following day at Cornelius' house and goes in. And then this is the punchline. Gets invited in. Peter told them, you know, it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. If people come around your house, you could try that as an opening line. Uh, or if you go around someone else's house, well, so yeah, it's against the rules for me to associate with you, but I'm here. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. This is the revolution. It's shocking. It's extraordinary. And if you read on a bit, you realise that God then joins in by pouring out his Holy Spirit on Cornelius and his family and his servants, all of whom were Gentiles, weren't Jews. And the Holy Spirit comes and they're filled with the Spirit. They start praising God and speaking in tongues and then they get baptised. The door has been opened, people. Now everybody, by faith, if they come to God, is in. Is in. It's amazing. This is the revolution. It's shocking. And yet again, what God has done and what he's had to do with Peter is that he's pushed him to the edge. He's taken him beyond where he's comfortable and he's gone to the people who are not in yet. And that's where the action happens. That's where something amazing happens. That's where the Spirit of God is poured out in this story. So I have one simple message for myself and for us today. If you want to see the works of God, if you want to see God's kingdom come, if you want to see people meet with God, then you have to allow God to push you to the edge. Because it's at the edge. It's at the edge where the church meets the world, where we as Christians meet and spend time with people that don't yet know him. It's so often it's there where the action happens. Did anyone study plate tectonics at school? Do you remember that? Geography lessons, all those plates that make up the world. Now, those of you that live in this country, we don't have earthquakes, do we? I have very little ones. There's sometimes an odd, like, gentle one in Cardiff or something like that. But we don't have earthquakes, we don't have volcanoes. We don't have any wild animals either. It's really quite dull here, and, but it is. It's quite safe and many of us like it. We don't do earthquakes and volcanoes. Why do we not have earthquakes and volcanoes? Because they're not at the edge of a plate. Whereas it's the edges where the action happens. 
So if you want volcanoes and earthquakes, I appreciate most of us don't, don't uh, we're not chasing this. You've got to go to Tokyo, you've got to go to California. You've got to go to the Philippines. That's where these things happen because they're at the edge where two meet and the fireworks happen. And that's what it's like with the church. It's, it's so often it's at the places where we are in touch with the people that aren't yet part of it. That's where the fire happens and the volcanoes happen. And it's a bit uncomfortable, it's a bit strange, it's a bit weird, but it's the things that God does. We have to push to the edge. Why? Because it's the way Jesus behaves. He does it again and again. Last week's story was like it with the Canaanite woman. The story this week, again, is with the people that were a bit on the edge, beyond. And God turns up and meets with them. Jesus does it again and again because he said, I came to seek and save the lost. And it's not because he's not interested with those who are already in. It's because I would say he's especially interested with those who haven't got there yet. Push to the edge. So, I have three very simple instructions for myself and I want to put them out to you. These are them. Number one, pray every day. I would say that anyway about anything, almost any subject we would look at, I would be an encouragement for something that's an important part of our life. Just pray Find somewhere, some, some time to pray every day and talk to God. But in that prayer, number two, ask God, have the courage to ask God, Lord, is there somebody or somewhere you want me to go to or to speak to or to message to or to pray for? Somebody that I'm not expecting, someone who's on the edge, someone who's further away. Is there somebody or a number of people you want me to go to? Ask him that question. Have the courage. Lord, where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to go to? Who do you want me to bless or to pray for or to share with or go and visit or send a text to? Ask him and then do it. Because it's there at the edge. That's where the action is. Just do it. I remember one of the first times I, I did this. I'd, I'd started to pray. I was praying every day and I was saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? And I'd just moved to Portsmouth, the city on the south coast of Britain. I was living there for a year. And I prayed one morning and I felt God saying that I should go to the tower. And I didn't know Portsmouth at all. I didn't know if there was anything like that there. And, and I said, well, Lord, what should I? So I got a map out. I got a map out of Portsmouth and I looked at it and there is a place that I've put a picture up on the screen. It's called the Round Tower. It's part of the old sea defences there. And oh, okay, right, I need to go there. What, what should I do when I get there? And I felt God say I should go there and I'd meet someone and there was something going on in their life. I can't remember exactly what it was and that I should talk to them and offer to pray for them for this thing. I thought, okay, and I was so nervous. So I was so nervous about this. It's one of the first times I'd done anything this bonkers. And I was so nervous. And, and I was leaving the house to go down there, trembling and praying. And as I was leaving, I felt God say, don't walk, get on your bike. So it obviously meant I got there quicker. So I cycled down there. I only took a few minutes, went down there. And I walked up there just feeling like a plonker. And there was a lady sitting on the top of the tower just with, and she had a child with a baby in a, in a pram. And again, I just felt like an idiot, but I thought, come on, that's what I'm here for. And I went over to this woman. I said, look, this is going to sound really weird. I'm a Christian. I'm from a church up the road. And I've come from God. No, I didn't put it quite like that. But I did say... I was praying and I thought God wanted me to come and talk to you. And then we, we talked about what was going on in her life. And I said this thing that God had given me. And I said, could I pray for it? And she said, yeah, great. And so I prayed for her. She was like, great. I walked away and goes, oh, that was easy. It really wasn't a big deal. Now, I'd made it a massive deal. But it's out on the edge. That's where the action is. And I've now done that hundreds or thousands of times, little things like that over the years. It's got a lot easier. 
Still nervous, but it got a lot easier. But I want to encourage all of us who are Christians already, push to the edge. Push to the edge. Take those steps of faith because that's where God works. Amen.